Okay. Morning. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your many thoughtful words and deeds to me. They are profoundly appreciated and humbling. Thank you, too, for your patience with our cyber problems that we've had through this entire uh, program. I think many of them have been resolved, and I'm sorry. But most of all, thank you for joining us here today, lovers of architecture, history, literature, and social justice. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, the chair of the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center, often referred to as HLPC, a group of dedicated individuals committed to informing the public about the past, present, and future of our, of our city. Our warmest thanks go to the really marvelous board of 470 West End Avenue. Unusual experience. This is a board that was activist in pursuing us. Usually we go to great lengths to persuade a board. This board did not have to persuade us, but they certainly demonstrated their interest in honoring a former resident of their building. It's very much appreciated. And thank you too for Arnie Laurie, who helped them progress this idea. For all of their interests, their assistance and support. So we are here to commemorate the life and the remarkable work of the novelist, playwright, essayist, poet, and activist, James Baldwin. For those who asked, the Zoom program today will be recorded thanks to Simeon Bankoff, it would be nice if you let us all see each other if you can. Simeon is really known as the executive director of the 151 member strong historic districts that comprise all of the five boroughs. But he generally generously serves as our Zoom coordinator. So if there are any lapses please understand, but he's very good about it. The video will be available for those who asked as well through the Diamondstein Spielvogel video archive that is part of the David Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Duke University and links in to other sites. And now let us begin our program. Born in 1924 in Harlem, the literary talents of James Baldwin well, favor, were evident at the remarkably young age of 13. He attended the Frederick, Frederick Douglass Junior High School, where he met the already nationally very well-known Harlem Renaissance poet, County Cullen, who was already too a counterculture icon. County Cullen taught English, French, and creative writing at the school and became Baldwin's mentor. <laughs> Cullen was the most famous black writer in America, among the most famous black writers, but way up there by the 1920s. He died in 1946 when Baldwin was just 22. Baldwin attended DeWitt Clinton High School. We generally don't delve that far back, but these were great influences on his life and work. In the Bronx, where he was the liter literary editor of the school magazine, after high school, he worked odd jobs while pursuing his writing. By his early 20s, he published reviews and essays in nationally significant publications, including The Nation, 
commentary and partisan review. I don't presume that any of you, uh, it escapes any of you, that these were and continue to be a most, among the most progressive um, <laughs> magazines there are. I have only one person on my screen and he's very handsome, but there might be others uh, that you'd like to have share the screen. <coughs> Despite all this success, Baldwin fled to France by 1948 to escape racism and homophobia. While in France, he wrote the powerful semi-autobiographical novel, Go Tell, it to the, Go Tell It on the Mountain in 1953. He returned to the United States by 1957. His book, The Fire Next Time, was about Excuse me, is it, are, are our little cyber hounds here again? Because there are other voices? We're up to, we returned to the United States in 1957, where his book, The Fire Next Time, which was about the Black experience in the United States, electrified the United States. Although he was marginalized by some because of his homosexuality, his remarkable essays explore the inter intricate intertwining of class, sex, and race. In the United States, they reflected and still reflect the complex issues with which our nation still struggles. Um, Simeon, I am getting a shot of somebody's tummy and I have an idea they wouldn't like it. And there might be other more pleasing uh, things you can put on the screen. Might you be able to do that? Hey, Barbara Lee, there, there are multiple images on the screen. It's just how you've got your view set up on the upper right-hand corner. All I have is me. Barbara Lee, if you click on view, if you see that in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you can then choose gallery view and that will show you everyone. On one page and then you may have to go to the next page. Thank you, Sarah. Knew I could count on you. That's great, thank you. In any case, we're back to Mr. Baldwin and we left him talking about the issues with which we still struggle. From 1948 to 1968, he traveled to Turkey, Africa, England, Israel, and back and forth between France and the United States and called himself a commuter rather than an expatriate. In 1970, he moved to the south of France and in 1986 was made a commander of the French Légion d'Honneur. Baldwin lived in saint paul de vence until his death in 1987. I'm going to end this with a quote from him. He believed, and this is the quote, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it, many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. Many have done much to, illum to illuminate that thinking and a part of our audience today through their very own work, and you will hear some of it. We're going to begin with Sarah Carroll, who just guided me to this view and guides a rather fractious bunch from time to time. She is the chair and a commissioner of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. It is the largest, excuse me, 
Municipal Preservation Agency in the United States. She is indeed a lifelong preservationist, a native New Yorker who started her career at the Landmarks Preservation Commission in 1994, where she has served in various capacities during the past 27 years. Is it only 27? Including as the Deputy Director of Preservation, the Director of Preservation, the Executive Director, and now the Chair. In 2012, she received the very well-deserved Sloan Public Service Award for her outstanding work at the Commission. In fact, she joins us today to speak about the introduction of the Landmarks Preservation Commission's new equity framework and its relationship to the, I hope as well, to the Historic Landmark Preservation Center Medallion Program. A quick aside, uh, having spent a great deal of my life traveling abroad, particularly in England where my mother lived, uh, I was always noticing their commemoration of historic sites. And finally, it became obvious to me, we should be doing the same thing. So I created the Cultural Medallion Program. Believe it or not, that was created in 1995 and inspired by London's Blue Marker Program that I'm sure many or all of you have seen. But their message, of course, was not what I had in mind. It was Disraeli was born here or X lived here. And we give a more unexpurgated version. And you might notice through the years, the text has become longer and longer, part by people's response to what we consider the huh factor, that they should be reading the text and say, huh, I didn't know that. And very often that is the case. In any case, after a lengthy review, like two and a half years, by the Landmarks Commission, by the then uh, Art Commission, later the Public Design Commission, and so on, where everyone tried to redesign the plaque as they did my historic district street signs, both of them, particularly the street signs, mandated by law, state law, and can't be changed in terms of size, font, size of letters and so on. It was eventually approved. But the goal of the cultural medallion program has always been to inspire New Yorkers with a pride of place and inform visitors about the rich and the multiple histories of our city. Now that effort assumes even greater meaning with the Landmark Preservation Commission's new equity framework developed to ensure diversity and inclusion in designations, effective outreach, transparency, and fairness. Thank you for your effort in making that a reality. And thank you for joining us here today, Sarah Carroll. Great. Thank you, Barbara Lee. And I'm thrilled to be here today among such distinguished individuals to honor the life and work of James Baldwin. As chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, I have made it a priority throughout my tenure to ensure our designations reflect and foster our incredible diversity, which I believe is New York City's greatest strength. And amidst calls for change and equality and the Black Lives Matter movement, on January 19th, 2021, this past January, I launched an equity framework that publicly reaffirms LPC's commitment to equity in all aspects of our work, including our designations, our regulation, our administration, and um, archaeology, and in, in every aspect of our work. Addressing equity has been my priority throughout my tenure. In uh, 2019, we launched an LGBT initiative 
that resulted in the designation of six sites important to the city's LGBTQ and civil rights history, including the home of celebrated novelist, essayist, poet, and civil rights advocate, James Baldwin, that served as his New York residence from 1966 to 1987. Whoops, excuse me. Please Sorry, help. and I just lost my screen, so pardon me. Okay, so in, um, Following that, we also designated five buildings that represent the diverse history of Tin Pan Alley, acknowledging the harsh realities faced by African Americans at the turn of the 20th century, as well as their achievements. And earlier this month, we designated 75th Avenue, which recognizes the important contributions of the NAACP, as well as many progressive organizations that advance social justice and equity. The commission also designated the Harriet and Thomas Truesdale House at 227 Duffield Street in Brooklyn, which represents the important role the city played in the efforts to abolish slavery. And we are currently in the process of designating the Dorrance Brooks Square Historic District, which has rich associations with the Harlem Renaissance and the civil rights movement, and would be the first historic district named for an African American. We continue to study properties across the city that reflect the diverse history and that influence all of our communities. And we expect to bring more forward this year. Today, we're here to recognize one of the leading voices of the civil rights movement, James Baldwin. Because historic buildings embody the stories and experiences of the people who lived in them, it is only fitting that we acknowledge his life and work with a cultural medallion at the Belvoir at 470 West End Avenue, one of his New York City residences and located within the Riverside West End Historic District Extension 1. James Baldwin lived at this re Renaissance Revival style apartment building in the 1960s prior to purchasing 137 West 71st Street, the building we recently designated for its associations with James Baldwin. With this cultural medallion at the Belvoir, we are not only recognizing the fact that Baldwin lived at this building, but his accomplishments and legacy to New York City and the world. His experiences in New York City from his childhood. Oops. Jeez, I'm having my own technical problems. His experiences in New York from his childhood in Harlem to the places he frequented and lived as an adult influenced his life in writing. Born in Harlem in 1924, right in the midst of the Harlem Renaissance. Baldwin was shaped by his early experiences in New York City, which can be seen in his first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Considered an American classic, it tells the story of a young African-American boy in the 1930s in Harlem. With his second novel, Giovanni's Room, he became a pioneer by introducing gay and bisexual characters, which was unprecedented at the time. It was a work of extraordinary courage, which exalted love while disdaining society's traditional distinctions on race and sexual orientation. So central is the book to LGBT literature that one of the country's earliest gay bookstores is named Giovanni's Room. In addition to being a leading voice on, uh, for the LGBT community, James Baldwin was a fierce advocate for African-American rights. The publication of Nobody Knows My Name, which contains essays on his travels to the American South, where he met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and his next novel, The Fire Next Time, cemented his reputation as a leading authority on the Black American experience and one of the country's most eloquent and widely read writers on civil rights. James Baldwin was also a man of action. In 1963, he convened a meeting between prominent African Americans and Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy to frame civil rights as a moral issue. He frequently appeared on television and delivered speeches on college campuses. 
He also participated in several notable events, including an appearance with Dr. Martin Luther King at Carnegie Hall, a New York City landmark, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, and a forum held by the gay anti-racism group Black and White Men Together, where he spoke publicly about his sexuality. Baldwin continued to write and published works of fiction and nonfiction and remained politically and socially active up until his death in 1987. His legacy lives on through his works, which have reached countless lives, and through his influence on other writers and public intellectuals, both during his lifetime and continuing to today. So I wanna commend and thank the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center and its chair, Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel for choosing to honor the life and work of James Baldwin and for spearheading this wonderful cultural medallion program. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for sharing the intent and the performance thus far and the long-term vision of the commission. I neglected to mention one person that is critical to all of our preservation work. The internationally admired, recognized, decorated Massimo Vignelli uh, was a real yeoman in the service of landmarks. For close to three years, he accompanied me to every commission to get my street sign program that is now emulated throughout the United States, but it took New York City three years to approve it. It is now in every street in all of the 151 historic districts and serves as a model throughout the country. Uh, Massimo designed those pro bono. He did the same thing with the historic district maps, with the historic district markers and the cultural medallion and thank you, that 30 that Simeon is holding up is one of our cups that we were the chairs of every commemoration since the 15th, every five years, till its recent 50th anniversary. Do you have that one? Because he designed that too. And unfortunately he passed in the interim. So we now call ourselves Landmarks 50 plus so we can keep Massimo's design. We may adapt it in, turn, in time for the 60th anniversary, but I really felt in the light of all of this history, we simply had to reach out. I should tell you, and if any of you live in the building where he formerly lived, we tried on several occasions because he and his wife and partner, Leila Vignelli were really changed many aspects of graphic design uh, internationally and were so accorded. So we wanted to present a medallion to the building in which he lived, but they are not willing. If you live there, see what you can do. We're always interested in trying to persuade those who own buildings and we are a country of private property rights that they should collaborate more willingly. Perhaps you can help. Now we move forward to a very distinguished author, critic, editor, and curator, Hilton Alls, who was named a staff writer at the New Yorker in 1994 and theater critic in 2002. He received a Guggenheim Fellowship for Creative Writing in 2000 and the George G. Nathan Award for Dramatic Criticism for 2002-2003. His most recent book, White Girls, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. He won the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism in 27, 2017 for bold and original reviews that aim to put stage dramas within a real world cultural context, particularly the shifting landscape of gender, sexuality, and race. In June, 2020, 
He was named an inaugural presidential visiting scholar at Princeton University for the 2020-21 ac academic year. We hope he tells us what's next. We know what's most recently a resounding review approving and of the wonderful Alice Neal show currently on exhibition, currently on view at the Metropolitan Museum. Warm welcome to you, Hilton Alls. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Barbara Lee. You've been working, you've been working tirelessly to um, to make this event happen, and I'm I'm very honored to be a part of it. I'm um, reading just a little um, piece here um, to commemorate or to help commemorate this august occasion, and um, um, and on some level, words fail. Um, to describe um, the significance of this event, but I'll try. Plaques or markers are letters of a kind, missives to the dead that don't remain dead because we remember them in plaques filled with their history, bronze letters that stay put at the recipient's former dwelling, places where they lived and breathed and worked, and now get to live in again because of the work of the living who believe, who know that this is this, that this or that name belongs where its carrier once lived and worked now and forever. I commemorate the work Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel and her colleagues at the Historic Landmarks Preservation have put into commemorating James Baldwin's time at the Belvoir at 470 West End Avenue in New York, the city of his birth, the city that despite various quarrels and leave takings stayed in his bones until he sighed his last sigh in 1987. The great artist and humanitarian lived at this splendid address from 1963 until 1966. And since the artist's work is their life, it's fascinating to go back through the biographies and see that while Baldwin lived at the Belvoir, he was splitting his time between New York and Paris, two cities where he made homes, but I don't think he ever rested in either place for long because to do so would have meant giving up his dream of belonging. I think he always stood outside the reality of comfort while looking at, I'm sorry, going back. I think he always stood outside the reality of comfort while longing for it always. And to me, the incomparable essays, novels, plays, letters, poems are taken together one long letter about this dream, the dream of belonging and how do we meet it? And why do we separate from it because of hate or poverty or ignorance? He had suffered all of those things, of course, hatred and poverty and ignorance, sometimes within his very own childhood home. And if you lived in a place where love is fractured, you feel fractured. And if home is where the heart is, how could his heart ever feel whole or soothed by the idea of comfort? But that doesn't mean you don't long for it. In 1971, Baldwin wrote an open letter to my sister, Angela Davis, in which he said, if they come for you tonight, they will come for me in the morning. There's no doubt who they are. It's the same they that get, got elected to the Supreme Court despite the facts. The same they that gets acquitted for stepping on that black man's head. The same they who will gun you down because you're you and all that means to the bereft, sad minds and twisted souls. Throughout his career, Baldwin kept writing letters to Angela Davis, to his nephew James on the 100th anniversary, the abolition of slavery. And of course, there's his most famous letter, letter from a region in my mind, published in the New Yorker so long ago and known more generally as the fire next time. Letters are a kind of plea to connect and to soothe 
to correct or admonish, and best of all, to send love. And he could. Look at all the love he poured into his work while he stayed at the Belvoir. There he wrote The Fire Next Time and Blues from Mr. Charlie and a number of short stories and essays. And it was at this resonance too, where love was being given a chance with the actress Diana Sands and his friend Martin Luther King Jr. and all that history and pain had given him as well. Growing up in Harlem, 470 West End Avenue would be considered a downtown address. And I wonder what it must have been like for Baldwin to secure an apartment here and to put that key in his pocket while remembering how far he had come and needed to go. There he is now, walking out of the Belvoir's front door. Good afternoon, Mr. Baldwin, good afternoon. And he's looking up the street and then down at the world that made him and continues to make him as he looks up at the sky too. There's so much love in his eyes and in those manuscript pages he's taking to his editor, he's late again, but, but at least he has something like a home now, walls to wrap around the thin walls of his nearly porous soul. Love, that's the operative word this afternoon. And so because of all the love he showed us through that unsurpassable work, work that was generated by love and the dream of love and confusion and pain about the separation that racism and poverty causes while never resting, not quite, in the idea and reality of belonging. We're saying now with this plaque, this letter that will never get lost, that you belong, and specifically James Baldwin, you belong to us and Godspeed and thank you. Oh, thank you. That was exquisite. And you certainly kept each and all of us wrapped on every word. And I hope you will share with us that text and we will circulate it to everyone who is online because I think they'd like to review it. And I think we'll be quoting from it in the future freely you. with your permission. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. And now we turn to a visitor from abroad, um, Professor Magdalena Zaborowska is tuned in today from Warsaw, Poland. If you look at your screen, she's on the upper left wearing a white shirt. Can you wave to everybody? They see where you are. Thank you. Uh, when she is not there, she is a professor of Afro-American and African studies and American culture at the University of Michigan. She's the author of the William Sanders Scarborough Prize winning book, James Baldwin's Turkish Decade, Erotics of Exile. I mentioned earlier that it, as he was, so his peregrinations included a great deal of time in Turkey and you go on to write an entire book about it. And the author, uh, Magdalena, if I may, is also the author of Me and My House, James Baldwin, and Black Domesticity, together with uh, Erotics of Exile, both books were published by the Duke University Press. I'm pleased to say the latter in 2018. Professor Zavarovska is currently studying the spread of American notions of race and sexuality in post-Cold War, now known as Central Europe, then known as Eastern Europe, and that is how she refers to it. Her new publication is entitled Memory Wars. A warm welcome wherever you are. Thank you for taking the time. Is there a six hour difference where we are? Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for having me. It is a thrill to be in the presence of the legend, Barbara Lee Denstein Spielvogel. I thank you and your colleagues uh, at the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center for inviting me to take part in this distinguished dedication. 
And uh, here is a very hard act to follow. So here I am coming to you from Warsaw, Poland. And I would like to dedicate this short speech to the memory of my recently departed brother-in-law, Leszek Ciciłko, who was truly a member of the Baldwin tribe. And mine, like Hilton's, is a letter as well. Dear Mr. Baldwin, we've never met in person, yet I feel that we've known each other long. I have read all your books and have written to myself about your life in Turkey and France. For over two decades, I've labored to impart the beauty and wisdom of your words to students in five countries. Today, filled with gratitude to have been included in this commemoration of your genius in the city you loved, I'm writing to let you know that you must try to save your country once again. You use that dramatic expression many times with your usual rhetorical flair to refer to places and people that like Istanbul, Paris, Saint Paul de Vence, Maya Angelou, Yvonne Hu, and Gin Shazar and Lucien Hapertberger made profound impact on how you saw yourself and your craft as a writer. The story of your life, the places you've lived, link moments of unexpected salvation and give us hope that what is best about America can also be salvaged today. An interviewer once asked you, when you were starting out as a writer, you were black impoverished homosexual, you must have said to yourself, gee, how disadvantaged can I get? You brilliantly responded, oh no, I thought I hit the jackpot. It was outrageous, you could not go any further, so you had to find a way to use it. Your quip about the usefulness of challenges life threw at you as a working class African American gay man from Harlem channels your power to turn marginalized origins into world class literature. However, extolling a hero who succeeded against insurmountable odds is not really what you wrote about, and not what I would like to underscore today. What I propose we put to good use in this moment, our moment of need as a country, culture and communities at odds is the most important part of your legacy, your singular and compelling philosophy that drives all of your published and unpublished works. Since early boyhood, you imagined and fought for an America that did not come to pass in your time. Your vision of resilient humanity is rooted in compassion for others and calls for hard work, honesty, truth, and unsparing self-inquiry. Like you, it revels in joyful creative expression and plays as much with African diasporic forms as with those termed Western and American, all while creating a unique aesthetics and ethics. Anchored in what I term your philosophy of black, queer humanism, your books and life story are badly needed in today's embattled, bitterly divided United States. A note, I know that you weren't exactly down with either black or queer as terms during your lifetime. So please forgive my use of them in a nod toward contemporary audiences, or as you would have called them, children. Today, we the children, read black and queer in dynamic, shifting relationships with your life, oeuvre and each other, including contextualizing your well-documented ambivalence about all racial, sexual and gender labels. Pondering the term Afro-American in 1972 in No Name in the Street, for example, you called it two confusions and two undefinable proper nouns. Amidst cultural pretensions of history, terms like, terms like that were merely a mask for power, you argued, revealing that what is called civilization lives first of all in the mind. What a mind you had, a sharply witted theorist and fierce cultural critic, as much as a brilliant writer, you reconceptualized who we were as human beings in the late 20th century. Spinning all three words in its title into an alternative African diasporic vision 
that in its importance rivals that of Dante Alighieri's your black queer humanism rearticulates for today an old fashioned philosophical concept centering homo sapiens and their lives in science and logic rather than religious dogma. Yet you both embraced and dramatically reshaped this ideal through your essays, columns, novels, and activism, and you infused it with spirit, shade, and style. You painstakingly crafted a literary vision rooted in processes of becoming rather than in fixed notions of the self. A fierce reader and autodidact whose formal education ended in high school, you learned through your blood, gut, and bones that what was considered identity arose from fictions about seemingly insurmountable, deliberately scripted differences. Exploiting superficial varieties of body shape, skin tone, facial features, such fictions were broadcast as facts by politicians, teachers, and priests. They still are. They functioned as mutually exclusive binaries of race, black versus white, gender, masculine versus feminine, and sexuality, hetero versus homo, to name just a few, and have been used to justify ills ranging from sexual violence to slavery to mass incarceration. Your writing exploded such divisions to reveal how religiosity, misogyny, homophobia, colorism, and classism corroded lives in African-American communities. This airing of dirty laundry did not endear you to cultural and political elites. For example, no black publishing business in Harlem would hire you in the 1940s. You were nicknamed Martin Luther Queen among straight black men in the 1960s. Yet, while badly shaken by black rejection, you never gave up on your signature moral and aesthetic rigor. Black, homosexual, impoverished, you were the odd man out and you used it no matter how much it hurt. You still teach us that race, gender, and sex-based systems of oppression exist all over the world. Inspired by your life in Turkey, you studied the Quran and fell in love with the Kurdish writer, Yashar Kemal. You spoke for the Algerians during their colonial war with France. You supported both Jews and Palestinians. You admired and emulated African-American women writers and artists like Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, Florence Ladd, and Verta May Smart Grossvenor. You acknowledged your mother, Berdis, and paternal grandmother, Barbara, as your key artistic inspirations alongside the painter Buford Delaney, who served as your surrogate father figure when your stepfather, who gave you your last name, would not accept you for who you were. In your later years, you embraced feminine fashions with gusto. You wrote about androgyny and read about trans identities. In your last, still woefully unpublished play, The Welcome Table, your port parole is a woman. Few knew that you wanted to have children, though many would agree that you would have made a superb parent. Today, as we fight to embrace your vision, we have to contend with the so-called Baldwin brand that too often obscures the intersectional focus of your black queer humanism by emphasizing a race man rather than a father slash diva of queer studies, a realist writer rather than an experimental bisexual one, an essayist rather than a novelist, an orator modeled, modeled mo excuse me, an orator molded by the black church and Henry James rather than your own labor and genius, and an activist rather than a sophisticated theoretician who easily out-talked a white patrician at Cambridge. The prevalence of such representations not only cleaves your contribution into unhelpful binaries of, ident of identity, genre, or origins, but also suggests insidious forms of racialization, including the bigotry of low expectations and ethnic and gendered ghettoizations that obscure important ways we could put your legacy to good use. The America we live in today 
may be more divided than ever, but it is also facing a chance at humanistic renewal as women claim their power. I am now writing another book, and that's another book then Barbara Lee has mentioned, if I may. Um, it's actually a biography uh, for the Black Lives series from Yale University Press. This book will show how your Black queer humanism can help us fight white supremacy, xenophobia, transphobia, misogyny, and homophobia. I am writing it most of all to recover the parts of your life and vision that have been shamed and obscured. I am writing it to show how your humanistic project can save us. Mm. The Turkish writer Orhan Pamuk reminds that novels allow us to momentarily become the other, heeding this message alongside Polish writer Olga Tokarczuk's call for the tender narrator and Chimamanda Adichie's feminist warning to avoid the danger of a single story. I am writing about your vision of democracy and kinship across racial and ethnic groups, the vision that reminds us what we may be able to accomplish together. Years ago, when asked what you might have thought about a white woman from Poland traveling the world to research and write about your works and life, your erstwhile Turkish lover told me, smiling broadly, oh, he would have loved you. As you wrote in your last essay to crush the serpent, complexity is our only safety and love is the only key to our maturity. And love is where you find it. Hmm. And this letter with your powerful words from another country, the words of a tender black queer narrator whose love and spirit can lead us into good trouble and indeed can save us in our national moment of need. Ain't none of us really strangers. We all here for the same reason. Someone we love this dead. But don't lose heart, dear ones. Don't lose heart. Don't let it make you bitter. Try to understand. The world's already bitter enough and we got to try to be better than the world. You got to remember he was trying. Ain't many trying and all that try must suffer. Be proud of him. You got a right to be proud. And that's all he ever wanted in this world. Yours truly, Magdalena Zabrowska. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mag Magdalena, for that very complex, very interesting transnational interpretation. Uh, you are quite right. The world is in chaos, but I cannot overlook where you are seated, right in Poland. I think it is a tragedy what has occurred in your country and its near neighbors, and I hope that you take some of that brilliance and energy and apply it to where you are as well. But thank you for your very astute, careful, passionate insights. They were illuminating. Thank you so much. And now, um, let me tell you a bit about, if you don't already know, about Suzanne Laurie Parks. I, Phenomena, really. A multi award winning American playwright, musician, a MacArthur Fellow, the first African American woman to receive the Pulitzer Prize in drama for Top Dog Underdog. Her adaptation of Gershwin's Porgy and Bess won the 12, 2012 Tony Award for the best revival of the musical. Her project, listen to this one, 365 days, 365 plays. Yes, she wrote a play a day for an entire year, was produced in more than 700 theaters worldwide and created one of the largest grassroots collaboration in theater history. Her novel, Getting Mother's Body, was published by Random House in 2003. 
Laura Parks also works extensively in film and television, most recently in her spare time as the screenwriter for the U United States versus Billie Holiday. She has served as showrunner, executive producer, head writer for Genius Aretha, and Parks is, writes songs and confronts and fronts her band, Sula and the Noise. Uh, for those of you who don't recall, Sula is the name of Toni Morrison's second novel. I had a long correspondence with Susan, uh, Suzanne Lori Parks, who travels all the time. Please excuse me now. Um, who travels all the time. And just uh, last night, in fact, late last night, very late last night, I received a note. Hello, Barbara Lee. Regarding the event tomorrow, I'm traveling and my internet connection is unsteady at best. It is very frustrating that my tech is not up to speed on this end. I just got dropped from yet another Zoom call and there's no way that I'll be able to participate tomorrow as planned. What I'm proposing is that I record a five minute speech, email it to you no later than tomorrow morning. Of course, I received it in the middle of the night so that you could include my loving tribute with the others. I hope this works for you guys. Well, it certainly worked for me. There is no substitute like having her here herself, but Simeon, will you please play what she recorded for us? Of course. This is Suzette Glory Parks. Now, how do we get her sound? Give me a moment. Let me just uh, make certain two that the moments. sound is correct. Give you two moments. In her band, she sings. Uh oh. Does everyone have sound? He wrote necessary essays, passionate novels, moving plays. The world remembers James Baldwin as a formidable activist and a loving and fiery speaker. His words quench our thirst for truth and satisfy our hunger for writing that tells it like it is. Any place that he wrote or spoke from became a pulpit. And just above his head burned an eternal flame, an eternal tongue of fire for Mr. Baldwin it seemed like every day was Pentecost, and I'm pleased that the world continues to sing his praises. I know and love his works, and I also had the good, great fortune to be uh, a student of Mr. Baldwin, so I know him, I know Mr. Baldwin as a writing teacher. In the fall of 1983 at Hampshire College up in Massachusetts, James Baldwin taught his first creative writing class and I was lucky enough to be one of the 15 students in the classroom. We gathered on Monday afternoons, and to get admitted, each of us applied by sending in a short story. Now later, his friend, the writer Andrew Salke, who had helped him sift through all the queries from the potential students, told us that the stack of applications was over six feet high. Now we, the 15 who were chosen, we were so lucky. Now, I remember our very first day of class, it was a Monday, and we sat around a table and waited for Mr. Baldwin to arrive. Now, I had been waiting for Mr. James Baldwin for years. From way back when I was in fifth grade, and my mom and dad had found me sitting underneath our piano with the family dog, and I, was, I had my notebook out and I was scribbling. What are you doing? My mom wanted to know, and I said, I'm writing my novel. And so for Valentine's Day, 
my mom and dad to encourage my writing, they presented me with a copy of James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. Now he filled my fifth grade self with wonder and he made me weep for the world. Now often I'd look back, I'd look on the back of that book and I'd see uh, on the dust jacket, I'd see his handsome face gazing back at me. And I was just like, you know, Intozaki Shange's Lady in Brown when she fixed her spirit on Toussaint Louverture. Mr. James Baldwin became my North Star. Now, 10 years later, I was barely out of my teens and I was meeting him for real. I was studying creative writing with him. I sat tall in my chair. I expected him to fill the doorway and he did. Although he only was ever, he was only about my height. He was very finely made and his smile was generous and radiant and his eyes were all seeing, all knowing. Each week we would read our stories to him. He was a very generous teacher and he offered kind uh, critique, which was full of a lot of tough love. And what did I learn from him? What did I carry forward? Don't be too scared to grow. That's one of the things he told me often, smiling. Like if Ariza had been too scared to grow, she'd still be singing gospel. And if Nina Simone had been too scared to grow, she'd still be Eunice, you know? For fear can, keep you from growing, it can keep you from reaching your full and splendid potential. That's something Mr. Baldwin taught me and that, that's something that I carry forward. I found hanging out with Mr. Baldwin very different from reading his works. He was Jimmy to us, he was funny. He loved a good time. He believed in solidarity among black people. He taught me by example, how to be respectful of the black spirit. When I read my short stories aloud to him in class, I would do a lot of gesturing and he suggested that I take up writing for the theater, that I try writing for the theater. I was terrified, partly because I was not a theater kid, also partly because I knew that Mr. James Baldwin had been dear friends with Lorraine Hansberry. And she, of course, is one of the great playwrights. Man, maybe I could pick up her sword and shield or better, maybe. I could find my own. Because hanging out with Jimmy could empower you like that. Because hanging out with Jimmy made you realize that you had a job to do and you better get to it. Because hanging out with Jimmy reminded all of us that we were something special. That we were worth more than what the man saw in us. That the man's price tag on you wasn't nothing nearly as beautiful as the crown that had already been bought and paid for by your own people. Now, Jimmy walked the talk in class and he would remind us often that he saw too many people who were just sitting around talking but not walking. And his famous quote is he realized that, you know, one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once the hate is, is gone, they'll be forced to deal with the pain. He encouraged us to be fearless in dealing with black pain and fearless in dealing with black joy and embracing black joy. He also taught me by example that brothers and sisters owed love and respect and support. They should give that freely and often to each other. And that black unity was and is the best way to dismantle white supremacy and anything else will just fall short. When it came time to give me, give me a grade in, in for that class, um, they didn't have grades, they didn't give grades at Hampshire College. So he had to write an evaluation. And uh, he wrote a sentence about me. Susan Laurie Parks is a charming and beautiful creature who may become one of the most valuable artists of our time. That's what he wrote about me. And I was barely 20. And in the many years since then, James Baldwin continues to inspire me. And I've endeavored to become an artist of value who continues to offer something to the world, to make something of myself because I didn't, and I don't have the heart to prove James Baldwin wrong. Now on the occasion of this dedication, which also sadly is the one year anniversary of the murder or the lynching of our brother George Floyd, I so appreciate the opportunity to remember Mr. James Baldwin with you. He lives in each of us and we've got a job to do. So let's go do it.
Thank you. Well, I hope you found her and is the sound on? Can you hear? I hope you found her as prescient as James Baldwin was. I think she is a dazzling creative force and such an animating presence who really went to great trouble to fulfill her commitment to be with us followed up several times today. So I hope you each give her a little remembrance and nod for going to the trouble of trying to keep her word while traveling. I think it was worth listening to. Most of all, thanks to each and all of you for joining us today. We are up to the moment that we will dedicate the cultural medallion Arnie Laurie, if you were at the building, instead of about to go surfing, I say that he's, his background of his photo is some beautiful ocean somewhere. Um, he would be removing the covering and I've asked Hilton Alls to please read the text. Simeon, can you do some more of your magic? Um, this of course, text? probably. Uh, Mr. Alls apologizes. He had a scheduling conflict and is unable and had to jump off. Um, wouldn't let me. Later, and I told him by about 10 minutes or so. Yeah. Will you uh, please read it? Of course. A moment, please. So there you see the building. Here it is covered. Antara, can you uncover it? There we are. Can we have a close-up? Can we read the text? <laughs> I shall read the text in a moment. Let me find that close-up. <laughs> well, you're doing wonderfully well. While he's doing that, let me thank each and all of those who participated in this very exciting, informative, and for me, inspiring program and those of you who helped make it possible. Most of all, I do thank you, our faithful and interested and interesting audience. Um, it is, as you know, uh, we're always looking for new subjects for notable New Yorkers. Since 1995, we have 123 markers up in each of the boroughs. Some boroughs uh, were more fertile ground for the range of people we honor, but please look around and think of who you think is worthy of being in such august company. An individual who's made a significant contribution and a building which you worked, lived, played, still stands, and you have verifiable information where that is, please let us know. And now, Simeon, can we go to you and the text? Of course. James Baldwin, August 2nd. No, we don't have that on now. At least I don't. don't. No, I don't. No one does. All and right. Let me do this again then. Can you see it now? We can. I Very good. James, go on. James Baldwin, August 2nd, 1924 through December 1st, 1987, the Belvoir, 470 West End Avenue, Manhattan. One of the most prescient writers of the 20th century, whose work addresses the complex plurality of human identity, James Baldwin lived here and in Paris from 1963 through 1966. Born and raised in Harlem, his literary gifts were noted by the age of 13. Baldwin's first article, Harlem Then and Now, 1937, appeared in the Frederick Douglass Jr. High School Magazine. He was literary er editor of the DeWitt, Hi DeWitt Clinton High School Magazine as well. In 1948, already published in major literary magazines, Baldwin left the US for France to escape racism and homophobia. 
While there, he wrote the powerful semi-autobiographical novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, 1953. Baldwin returned to the US in 1957. His book, The Fire Next Time, 1963, about the black experience in the US electrified the nation, even as he was marginalized by some in the civil rights movement because of his homosexuality. In 1986, Baldwin was made a commander of the French Legion of Honor. He is also the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Ford Foundation grant. In 1970, he moved to St. Paul de Vence in the south of France, where he lived until his death. Thank you, Simeon. Uh, we have the unusual circumstance of another cultural medallion ceremony tomorrow. In fact, it could not be a greater contrast than it is to this one. It celebrates the contribution of the legendary Beaux-Arts firm of Delano and Aldrich. If those names are familiar to you, uh, it is for good reason. You might remember that he was Mr. Delano, a distant cousin of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Mr. Aldrich, a relative of then Senator Aldrich. So these were two very well connected fellows who met while studying in the abroad and then in the office of career and Hastings. A very different background, a very different contribution, but make part of what makes our beloved city as complex and usual, and I hope still having a great future. Uh, and this is further evidence. So please join us tomorrow. And thank you each and all of you for being with us today. I hope you found this as inspirational and as moving as I did. And as Suzanne points out, the irony of it occurring on the day of the first anniversary of Floyd's death as his family meets with President Biden and it is to be hoped, forging a better way forward. Thanks to each of all of you, each and all of you for joining us. Goodbye for now. <laughs>